Ever wake up feeling so good that all you can think is, oh, this day doesn't stand a chance? Yeah, that was me today. The alarm went off at 5.50, and I felt great, practically jumped out of bed. In my drawer, there was my favorite t-shirt, clean and unwrinkled. Next to the bed, some fresh new kicks. Oh, yeah. I danced to the bathroom, brushed my teeth, gelled my hair. Oh, yeah. Uh, wait, uh, hold on, that looks off. What if I just, just tweak my hair a little bit there, maybe, maybe change it here? Huh. It's like, uh, ah, screw it, I gotta go. Anyways, nothing can stop me today. I walked outside, beautiful out. I hit my favorite coffee shop down the street. First one there, like it's all for me. I sat down and wrote this very intro. Oh, yeah, uh, wait, no, hold on. Hold on, that felt off. What if I just tweak a word here? Maybe change it there? Ah, what the hell? I mean, I, I nailed my morning routine, I wrote all the paragraphs, but I just can't stop tweaking things. Why, why won't this paragraph feel finished? Today on the show, the art of the unfinished. Why sometimes the right move is to share something with the world that you feel is slightly incomplete. I'm Jay Kunzo, and I know you're going to finish this episode. This episode of Unthinkable is supported by Right Side Shirts. So I bought this new watch from Right Side. It's bright orange with a rainbow swirl on the watch's white face. And it's been drawn by Nataki, a seventh grader. Looking at it, I can't help but notice that Nataki could have spent more time carefully outlining this swirl. There are some rough edges, and uh, all of them can kind of be smoothed over with just a few more minutes' time. But the more I look at this thing, the more I realize that the unfinished look is exactly what makes it work. It's handcrafted, and that's the point. Nataki, you are wise, my friend. Wise beyond your years. Or maybe specifically because of your years. Anyways, to see this watch that I really do love and dozens of other designs on all kinds of shirts and phone cases and watches and more, go check out rightsideshirts.org. And if you buy something there, the proceeds help fund local art education. Win-win. That's rightsideshirts.org. Sometimes I feel like my creative intuition, that internal guide that I have, is kind of, sort of, maybe... Well, drunk. Not all the time, just once in a while. Mostly, he tends to show me the way. We're slashing through a jungle trying to get to that big mountain we see away in the distance, and he actually helps me find the way forward. Most of the time, I'd be lost without him. But every so often, I feel like he's snuck a couple of stiff drinks when I wasn't watching, because I'm pretty sure we're stumbling around in circles now. I want to say, hey, um, buddy... I think we've passed this intro paragraph more than enough. But I trust him, and so I write that paragraph a second time. Then a third. Then a fourth. Um, can, can we move forward yet, dude? Oh, no, 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 don't worry. I just want to make sure we didn't miss something while we're here. Like, maybe we should insert a word in that second line. Just, just one more time, okay? And so on and on we go, until finally, enough's enough. We should be done writing this intro by now. Let's move on. As craft-driven creators, our intuition often tells us that we're this close to being ready to move forward. We can't finish a project until we've gotten it exactly right. Otherwise, it feels incomplete, and so do we. Now, before you switch to another podcast, what if I told you that sometimes to get better at your craft you can actually benefit from sharing some things in the world that are unfinished. And taking this one step further, what if we'd be more successful if we willingly and constantly shipped our work precisely because it wasn't done yet? What would you say to all that? Probably, Jay, come on, it's unthinkable.
Welcome to Unthinkable. I am Jay Kunzo. And each week we share stories of people who reject what they're supposed to do and instead follow their intuition and all the surprising places that leads. Sharing projects that we don't feel are finished can be uncomfortable. But in our last big episode two weeks ago, we talked about our need to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. We went outside our echo chamber to hear the story of a psychologist who made the guests at his mom's picnic a bit uncomfortable. And we talked to a creative director whose background is actually in improv comedy, working with the likes of Amy Poehler and Stephen Colbert's lead writer. And he told us to train ourselves constantly following that gut-wrenching feeling. So if you missed that episode, go back and listen to Comfortable Being Uncomfortable. After that episode, I started to think about what makes creative individuals uncomfortable almost universally. And I landed on this idea of being forced to share unfinished work. I'm guessing that you, like me, have had a boss or a peer or a client that wants to see something now, but you feel like it could use a few more revs. You want a few more minutes or hours or even days. They want it, but we don't think it's done. But that assumes two big things. First, that unfinished work is immediately worthless. It's not worth showing it to anybody until we feel it's done. But is it? And then the second assumption is that we alone know when something is done. But do we? To help us explore these assumptions more deeply, we're sharing a story today reported by a fellow craft-driven creator and a new unthinkable contributor, Kara Hogan. So Jay. So Kara. <laughs> I want you to do me a favor. Take out a dollar bill and look at the side with George Washington on it and tell me what you see. Okay. Got the, the dollar bill right here. <laughs> I see uh, a very serious looking George Washington, very scary guy. Uh, he's surrounded by a frame. It's kind of ornate and flowery. He's got a jacket on with like that scarf on his neck and then Washington kind of like emblazoned underneath it. I don't, I don't know. I've never actually looked at the dollar bill at this level of detail, I guess. Right. Most people haven't. It's this iconic thing, this American symbol, but we don't really look at it that closely. Right. What would you say if I told you that this portrait was never finished? It was actually painted by famous American artist Gilbert Stewart in 1796, but he never delivered it. Symbol of America. Yeah. How did that even happen? That's what I wanted to find out. Hi, there. Hi Professor Hills. Yes, I'm nice sorry, to I'm you. No. I'm Patricia Hills, and I'm Professor Emerita here at Boston University in the Department of History of art and architecture. I taught at Boston University for 36 years. Professor Hills specializes in art from the colonial period to the 20th century, and she explained that Gilbert was a prolific portrait painter. Before everyone took selfies on their phone every day, this was the only way you knew what anyone looked like. I mean, before the days of photography, you know, you did a very good drawing or a very good oil sketch or even a finished work and that would be the basis for doing many other portraits. I think in terms of portraits, I don't really know of many other portraits that are unfinished. Mm. You know, I think that basically people finished them and gave them to the patrons. This specific painting of Washington was commissioned along with a portrait of Martha Washington just before the president retired in 1796. But as we now know, Gilbert never delivered it. So, okay. That begs one very poignant question, why? Exactly. This is what you know. he is alleged to have said, is that he never finished the picture because he didn't want to be tempted to sell it. And if the artist doesn't finish it, then he doesn't have to turn it over to the person who might be commissioning it. However, the facts don't quite back up this patriotic claim. Uh, the professor explained to me that when Stuart told the public that story, it sounds very great, but 
He may have had a less than pure motive behind it. Portraiture was the, the main way that artists earned their living. Gilbert Stewart was a very good businessman. Portraits of George Washington was a, a sort of light industry, you know, back in the, certainly in the early years of the Republic, you know, and there was the, the idea of the father of the country that was always very important. Uh, but certainly once somebody is dead, uh, there would be more of a demand for these kinds of images. So both Gilbert and his daughter actually used this unfinished work to paint hundreds and hundreds of copies. Uh, they then sold those copies to satisfy the American public's insatiable need for portraits of Washington. Right. Despite the less than illustrious history of this painting, it's still considered a masterpiece. So in 1869, the U.S. government decided to redesign the $1 bill, and they immediately thought of this portrait. Uh, Professor Hills actually told me that the fact that it's unfinished has made it more valuable. Today, many artists, uh, Alice Neal is one, Lucian Freud is another, many portrait painters do not finish their canvases. And they figure that they're finished when they're finished. Then the nice thing about an unfinished work is that you get a sense of the process of the painting. So many people even like the unfinished rather than the finished, you know, because the finished, the finished piece, you know, is so perfect, you know, and you don't really see what the process is. So I think with Gilbert Stewart, you do see that process. So the process is more important than the product itself. I've always argued that. Not everybody does. Some people like objects. I like the process that gets us to the objects. Okay, so I get it. There's power in sharing the work that you might think is incomplete with the rest of the world. But, I mean, most things you share, whether finished or not in your mind, won't end up on a nation's currency. So, are we all being too precious with our work? What happens when you freely and continually share work that you know isn't really done as your way of operating all the time? Everything I've ever shipped has been incomplete. This is Adam Siegel. Adam is a product manager who's mainly worked for tech startups, a world where Facebook's famous motto reigns supreme. Move fast and break things. The move fast and break things, um, just ship a mentality, is largely based around the fact that you're not going to be right 100% of the time. So the faster you can find out where you're wrong, the better off you'll be. In a past job, Adam was tasked with creating a mobile app called Champ. And Champ's purpose was to create a game-like experience that would alert a sales team when somebody else on your team closed a new deal. This would create both celebration and competition. The simplest way to explain it maybe is like we were trying to build a virtual gong. To get started, Adam didn't disappear into a room with his team to brainstorm the perfect idea and then emerge weeks later or maybe even months later with the finished app. No. Instead, Adam's very first step was to figure out something else. What I wanted to understand were what, are the, what has to be done in the first version of this app to be successful to customers and then for it to be viable from a technology standpoint. Success. He's aiming for success. And to aim for success requires that he share bits and pieces early and often, gather feedback to learn, and keep improving. Because when your job is to make something for others to use, you have to be able to admit what you don't know. You have to be able to admit that what you think you should build might be wrong. The first time you realize that you're wrong and that you're fallible, uh, and it probably comes pretty early in everyone's career, it's a very humbling thing and you realize you are better off. Everyone's going to be wrong and everyone's been through it, so don't try to protect yourself from being wrong. Try to find out where you're going to be wrong as quickly as possible. Adam is fairly new to product management, switching into the role just a few years ago. So it's tempting to believe that this is why he constantly gut checks his work before it's done. And I actually thought that too. But then I talked to Karen Rubin, a product leader at a company called Quantopian. Karen has been doing this job for more than a decade. And even she doesn't believe in trying to make some kind of finished product before launching. Instead, she thinks about building iteratively. 
building iteratively doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect and nothing ever is perfect. Rarely are things done, uh, but you can build something amazing that isn't perfect and still be pretty, pretty pleased with what you've done. 10 years of building products for a living, and she never feels like things are finished or ready. But here's where I'm personally struggling right now. If you lead a career like that, where you don't ever feel like something is done or perfect, how does that not just paralyze you? I mean, just thinking about this right now, I kind of feel like locking myself in a room, pulling my knees up to my chest, and just rocking back and forth very slowly. For Karen, though, she avoids that paralysis the old-fashioned way. She keeps a list. I always have a list, a list of the things that's like, this is what has to get done before we can launch. But in order to follow that list. And then the very important thing is I have some people that I trust in the company who aren't working on the product, and I make them go through that list with me. And typically, they take off 75% of it and tell me, this is not required, ship the product. Um, And it's important to have those people that you really trust who aren't as close to what you're building because you will always want to do 10 more things or five more things or just one more thing. There will always be one more thing you want to get done before it's time to launch it. And having that, that voice on your shoulder of the person being like, this is not necessary, get it out the door is important. And as a product manager, it'd be great to pretend that I could do that by myself all the time, but I can't. Uh, And uh, our other product managers here have served that purpose for me. Our CEO has served that purpose for me. It is generally incredibly painful to put everything on the board and have them be like, you do not need to do any of this, ship the product. Karen doesn't believe that all of us should just stop caring about making something great. Just the opposite, actually. She knows that to even have a chance, you need feedback from others along the way. Just the other day, for example, Karen's intuition said to keep working on something, something small, but something she felt mattered because maybe then the product would be complete. So she turned to a trusted advisor to figure this situation out, her VP of product, Dan Dunn. He's like, Dan, I think we need to do this one more thing. I think these are the reasons why we should do it. Can you be my voice and tell me if I'm wasting our time or if we should actually do this? And he actually agreed that it was worth doing that one more set of things. Um, But you can, I think, on the tail end, as of anything, there's a long tail of, of stuff you can do. And you have to be really ruthless then about making sure that it maps to the enterprise value of your organization. Like, is this the best thing we can be doing today? At Quantopian, Karen also plays the role of advisor with her own team, offering nudges in the right direction when someone's unsure or someone just can't get unstuck. And that nudge usually comes in the form of a very simple prompt. Can you convince me, like try to convince me we should do this instead. Convince me this is more important than that and turn it around and ask them to think about it from that perspective and try to sell me on this being the the thing so we can have the discussion. It's not about ignoring your intuition, but rather feeding it more and more inputs to better inform it. Because in a vacuum or really, I should say, a coffee shop or an office somewhere, wherever you and I create stuff, we might be wrong. In our moments alone, it's easy to get lost. When that jungle thickens and you lose sight of the mountain way in the distance, we start wandering in circles following our intuition, maybe without realizing it. Instead, what we really need to do is just pick a direction and move forward already. But that actually goes right to my initial point of how I need somebody to help me see the forest for the trees occasionally because I get so deep in the weeds of building something that I often our CEO Foss or Dan Dunn serves it for me where I have to go to them and be like, am I ready to launch? Like, help me walk through this Um, because we can all get too close to what we're building. As craft driven creators, we want to make art that we feel is perfectly done. But when you really stop to think about it, what does done even mean? Let's go back to Adam Siegel for a second. No, done is a, is, a, is a term that we come up with, right? There's no actual definition of done. It's like fitness, right? Everyone has their own definition of it. There's a certain art behind making things that are unfinished. Because, as it turns out, that's all making art ever actually is. Launching thing after thing that could always be just a little bit more complete.
If you really think about it, this is all kind of liberating. The goal isn't perfection, which implies that it's completely and totally finished. Instead, the goal is constant improvement. You shouldn't ask whether something is done. You should ask if it's better. Is it better than your previous draft? Is it better than the idea you started with? Is it better than the project you shipped last month? Look, I know you want to strive for perfection. I get it. I do too. But ask yourself, how would you recognize perfection if you were to somehow reach it? I think I know your answer. It's that internal guide, that intuition that you have that just kind of feels it, right? Well, that intuition is something that needs to be constantly informed to make it better and better as a guide. And the only way to inform it is to go get some perspective. So share your unfinished work. Talk to others. Go get some feedback. Start learning over striving for perfection. Stop writing and rewriting and rewriting again that intro paragraph to your podcast. Not that I know what, uh, what that's like or anything. <laughs> But my point is, if you do all of that, if you embrace the art of the unfinished, you might just find that little by little, your internal guide stops stumbling around all tipsy, sobers up, and says with utter confidence, this is the right path forward. Let's go. Coming up, our challenge this week to embrace the art of the unfinished and turn ourselves into killer perspective-gathering machines. It has to do with what Karen calls her alpha group and how you can get your own. Big thanks to Right Side Shirts, which supported our episode this week. Be sure to check out their online store for apparel designed by kids. Proceeds from purchases help fund local art programs in need. So check them out at rightsideshirts.org. And if you like our show, please consider leaving a rating on iTunes. It is the online equivalent of lighting a candle at the altar of Apple. And may they bless us and send us more listeners forever and ever. Amen. I need to give a huge thanks to my amazing team over at Monumental Shift, the world's first talent agency for business creators. They are Andrew Davis, Josh Cole, Caroline Nuttall, Elizabeth Davis, Ryan Brescia, and Andrew Swinney. Studio support this week from Chris Higgins, and music as always by the three-time national cheese-eating champion, Tyler Litwin. Oh, and one last reminder before our challenge this week. I'm sharing bonus content from all of our episodes exclusively on our newsletter, so be sure to sign up for that at unthinkable.fm. I send a short personal note each Monday morning and tons of good stuff that doesn't make the final cut of the episode you're hearing right now. That's unthinkable.fm. Okay, so here's our challenge for the week. Karen talked about the value of early product testers to give her feedback, which she calls her alpha group. Well, I kind of wanted to set up our very own alpha group. And, and here's the deal. Here's how this is going to work. First, Think of a project that you're working on right now that you know isn't finished or you feel is incomplete. Second, email me that project as a link, as an attachment, whatever. My email is j, j-a-y, at unthinkable.fm. And include in that email a question you have about how to finish it. And I'll try to answer every single one of those questions in a timely manner. Third, I'll give you my perspective on that project, just some basic feedback about what feels good and what you could improve. Let's say maybe three things per project, and I'll send it right back. Fourth, if enough people email me and you find this very useful, the team and I will consider stringing up, let's say, a Slack group or some other community forum where we can all have our own alpha group for all of our projects to be better and better at our crafts. As a final caveat here, let's say that this experiment applies only to the fall of 2016. So if you're hearing this in November of 2016 or later, this no longer applies. So will this work? I have no idea because this very idea to me is unfinished. And yet here I am sharing it with thousands of other people before it's done, before it's perfected, 
before I feel remotely good about it, and inviting you to do the very same. I guess you could say that that is unthinkable. Shout out to Amy Chick from Philly. She's one of our listeners turning her intuition into action. She's trying to move from a writer into a strategy consultant with content. Great job, Amy. Keep it up and good luck.